I will always remember him as a perfect gentleman, immaculate to the core in, in, in his dress, and everybody liked him, including me. Thank you. Yeah, so we're going to talk here about the uh, life and legacy of Merle McCurdy, but also the McCurdy family. And it is an, a phenomenal story, going back to the Underground Railroad to today. And this is actually a story about all of us. And so I have to thank uh, Judge Sheehan, also as far as Jim Willis. What a, we're, going to, we're going to get a building named after you. I'm going to tell you, you deserve it. Uh, but everyone who's been involved in this process, uh, Judge Connolly, everyone has helped out here with respect to it. So first uh, sh slide we're going to show here is we're going to start in the beginning here. Connie out of Ohio, we're going to tell the story of two brothers, Foster McCurdy and Merle McCurdy. So this is taken on the shores of uh, Lake Erie and the sand dunes here outside of Conneaut. Uh, they are uh, the children to Evelyn Foster. So you have that name Foster, his brother. Obviously, uh, Foster was named after his mother. And also Roy uh, McCurdy. And they're married in 1907 in Amherstburg, Ontario, but moved to Conneaut, and that's where both Merle and Foster are born. These families are incredible, absolutely incredible. And I'm gonna deal with two of the relatives here. One is Nasa McCurdy Jr. His father was a former slave, lived in Greene County, Pennsylvania. And you think Pennsylvania, that was a free state. Well, he was not manumitted. He didn't get his freedom until the 1790s. Immediately became a property owner, owned a couple hundred acres of land, became immensely successful. His son continued on in that farm, sold it, moved out to Zanesville, Ohio. And around the time of the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850, he sells everything and he moves to Amherstburg, Ontario. Sells everything, goes over there. So the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, if you helped someone, a freedom seeker, to Canada, you face six months in jail, $1,000 fine. $1,000 a fine equivalent of $125,000 in today's money. That's one side of the McCurdy ledger here, okay? Uh, picks up his roots in Ohio, goes over to uh, Amherstburg, and is helping freedom seekers as they're making their trek out to Canada. On the maternal side here, you have Levi Foster. We know that he was born in Stark County, about 60 miles south of here, in 1811. Born a free man. He moves over to the Toledo area, owns a farm, owns a livery stable, packs everything up, moves to Amherstburg, build, uh, uh, builds a farm there, and also a livery stable here. Here's a picture of it. So you're a freedom seeker. Where do you go and what do you do when you get there? Well, the goal is here from which to uh, get to Canada, but imagine that you're a freedom seeker and you have nothing. You have nothing. Where are you going to go? And this was what the McCurdy family and the Foster family, what they had given their lives for, from which to help others. So, routes along the Underground Railroad. When we talk about the Underground Railroad, we typically talk about Boston, Philadelphia. But there was a professor from Ohio State, Professor Siebert, who looked at the actual routes here of where Underground Railroad uh, routes were. Ohio, 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 principal. And if you look at our little corner of the world here, the Connecticut Western Reserve, you see the towns of Oberlin, Ashtabula, Cleveland, prominent here in the Underground Railroad. And where's the goal here if you're a freedom seeker? You're going to go out here to the St. Catharines area. You're going to go out into the St. Catharines area. Or you're going to go off into Western Ontario. This is where Amherstburg is. So this is where both the Foster and McCurdy families, when they leave Ohio and they move off to Canada. Now there's a bit of a divide. And it's amazing how well that this history is known here through just the newspapers. Nasa McCurdy, he ends up becoming a carpenter. He builds three AME churches in Western Ontario. 
He works with the uh, American Missionary Society and a pastor from Trumbull County near Warren, or in Warren, Isaac Rice. Levi Foster takes a different approach and he forms the True Band Society. He is critical here of what NASA has done with this American Missionary Society because he looks upon it as we're actually begging for money from which to help freedom seekers when they make it into Canada. And he states, what can we do a little bit of a different approach? Now this divide gets better here because they realize that education is the key part of this here. And here we have a notice in the Amherstburg Echo. And who is it that is appointing um, Levi Foster's son, George Foster, to be a member of the school board here in Amherstburg, none other than Nasa McCurdy. Amazing. These two families sort of combine here in a recognition here that when you have persons that have not been trained how to read and write and have limited skills, that's through education that we're going to lift everyone up. So cooperation turns into love. I don't know when it is that Evelyn uh, Foster and Roy McCurdy would have met, but here's an article from 1904 of a young person society meeting, and lo and behold here, we have Roy McCurdy as well as Evelyn Foster that meet in 1904, and you'll remember they got married here in uh, 1907. So why did they move back to Ohio, and in particular, why did they move to Kanyon? And it's because of Andrew Carnegie, the vision of Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was going to build the Conneaut Docks, or the Carnegie Docks here, in Conneaut, Ohio. He had visions with this inlet that it would take an ore boat 600 feet in length. And Conneaut was one of only two ports along the Great Lakes that could allow one of these great ships from which to come in and turn. And he also deals with a local inventor, Conneaut native George Hewlett, from which to make those giant, giant Hewlett ore machines to pick up, they could pick up 10,000 tons of coal within a handful of hours. All there in Conneaut, Ohio. So, there's also a Cleveland connection here to this as well. The first iron ore boat the Anoko was built in Cleveland in 1882. This is what gave Carnegie his vision. Because here's a boat that's 300 feet in length, can hold 2,000 tons. Why not build one 600 feet in length? So the Anoko, if you look at the ore boats even today, same design. So what you have here is you have the pilot house. This is where the officers stay. And then you have in the rear of the ship here, this is where you have the firemen that are putting the hundreds of tons of coal to have the engines run. And it's also where the cooks stay. Who do you think was up in the forward cabins with their own berths? Who was there? Who do you think? The white people. Yeah, it was going to be the whites and the educated. And no, oh, who, who was going to be the ones doing all the grunt work in the back? Yeah, it was going to be your immigrant populations and African Americans. Um, that's true. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation of what occurred there. And out in Ashtabula City, we had a number of Finnish persons and Swedes that moved into the area from which to actually do that type of uh, grunt work. But lo and behold for the Anoko, here is a newspaper article with respect to the Anoko, its first voyage, and who's one of the officers? None other than George Douglas McCurdy, Nasa McCurdy's son. It's amazing. I mean, if you think about this, this is a 70 years, okay? 70 years before Rosa Parks. And we have a situation where the McCurdy family is in the front of the boat in a management position on board the Anoko. Ever heard of this before? It's amazing. It's amazing. So here's a picture of uh, George Douglas McCurdy, and you can say, see here, he's a wealthy individual, isn't he? So like father, like son here, you have a situation where Roy, what is he going to do for his career? So this is a picture of Roy here in the center, 
And in the front of these boats, we had these state rooms and these wonderful dining areas because if you were an industrialist at the time and you needed something to do in the summer, say you were Carnegie or you were Rockefeller, let's tour the Great Lakes. Let's tour those. Well, where are they going to stay? They're going to stay in state rooms in the front of the boat, and we also need to have some nice dining areas for them. So here's one of those dining areas, the wood paneling on the side. And here you can see champagne is being served up front here. And the McCurdy family here were known as terrific uh, chefs. Uh, John D. Rockefeller was known to have a weak stomach, and you put him on, the, on a boat on Lake Erie, that's going to make things worse. He never got sick on the boat, and they credited the fact that there were such great chefs here, these stewards of the McCurdy family that you know, served the food on these boats. So, um, what happens with Carnegie's vision here is Carnegie ends up selling his interests in the steel mills here in uh, Pittsburgh. They unite another uh, steel mill in uh, sh uh, Chicago, the Federal Mills, Youngstown uh, Sheet and Tube, as well as uh, some of the steel mills in Cleveland. And you come up with the Morgan class of ore boats in 1906. Here we have Carnegie's dream that is created under the banner of U.S. Steel, the Steel Trust, 600 feet in length, capable initially of having 7,000 gross tons. Roy McCurdy was responsible here for helping to outfit the kitchen for this boat. And you can see that the design of this boat is very similar here to uh, the Anoka. So you're the McCurdy family, you're living in Conyot, you have uh, two small children, where are you gonna go to school? If you're in Atlanta, is it gonna be an integrated school? Probably not. You know, Nashville, yeah, no, probably not. Cincinnati, no, probably not. What about in Northeast Ohio? What's that? Yeah so, yeah, so here we have areas here of Ohio that have actually said, yeah, we're going to integrate schools. You look at Oberlin College here, 1833 allows African Americans and women to attend school on an equal basis of white males. So here's this, this picture is amazing to me. This is amazing. This is the Conneaut Dean Avenue School. Here's Merle up front, his brother Foster there in the back. Now granted that there are only two African Americans here in this picture, but how are they educated together? Pretty remarkable. And we have later accounts from other African American children who attended the Conneaut School, and they said that the teachers here were phenomenal, that they were 50 years ahead of their time with respect to civil rights. So we're going to take a quick family trip here. This is September of 1921. We have Merlin on the left, Roy, his father there, Evelyn, and Foster. They're going to go to the old Foster homestead in Amherstburg. This is the house in its heyday when it was a working farm and a livery stable. When they go there in the autumn of 1921, it's a little different. <coughs> Here's the Foster family that met in Amherstburg. Here's Evelyn, that's Merle's mother. Uh, here you have three individuals. You had Gertrude Bush, as well as Philo, and George uh, Douglas uh, Jr. that all served as stewards on the Great Lakes. And now we have Merle in 1926 here. So this is one of his, high, or one of his uh, pictures, freshman in, in high school. This is a time of transition here for, uh, for Merle, aside from going into high school. It's at this point that his parents get divorced. There was stress that occurred with respect to Roy having to be out at sea for long periods of time, and uh, you know, a divorce uh, situation occurred. How did Merle, how did he get along with his classmates here in the Western Reserve? And, and these are neat photos, right? Just like, you know, just like Willis and I here, you know? I mean, it's like, you know, it's just like we're integrated here. We're all one. And imagine that this is in the 1920s here. Would this happen anywhere else but Northeast Ohio? Merle graduates from high school in 1931. Uh, he's in the uh, choir, he plays football, he's involved in track, 
And his goal, his dream is to become a police officer. Is that a realistic goal for an African American in 1931 America? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, maybe, maybe not. So where does Merle end up first getting his first job? On the ore boats. So he follows in his grandfather's and father's footsteps. So here's Merle on the far left. He's a cook. What part of the boat is he on? Back to the boat. This may have been Merle's life, if you think about it. He probably would have been promoted to steward. Probably we would never have been in a position from which to try cases here with Jim. But the Depression starts in 1929. It doesn't hit the steel industry until 1932. So in 1932, they have a skeleton crew of those boats that we previously mentioned that are operating. Persons that were in the front of the boat, management positions, ended up becoming firemen or cooks just to keep their job. Both Foster and Merle that were working on the ore boats, they lose their jobs. So where do they go? Well, Foster gets a job as a bellhop at the Hollanden Hotel, downtown Cleveland. Merle joins him initially as someone to wash dishes, but he ends up getting a job as a bellhop as well. And he happens to meet this young woman who's the elevator operator. And every time that he tries to meet this young lady, she closes the door. It's one of those old Otis elevators that had the handle. So you used to go into, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself. You used to go into an elevator, floor please, and someone would take you there. And that's what, um, that's what uh, Merle's uh, wife, future wife, her, her job was, and that's Rosie. So here's a picture, their wedding photo in 1937, Merle and Rosie. She finally opened up the door and they got to talk, okay? They got to, they got to talk. And uh, uh, Rosie was the uh, love of uh, Merle's, uh, Merle's life. They end up moving in with their mother who had remarried, lived in Cleveland, and you have uh, Myrna who follows shortly, and then also Brenda. So, tragedy strikes though. Remember Merle wants to be a police officer. World War II starts, he has dreams of entering into the military. He suffers from tuberculosis. He has to be hospitalized for a lengthy period of time. His brother Foster joins the Army uh, Air Corps. And while he's in the hospital, he meets an attorney or someone who's going to law school at Western Reserve, Myron Huff. They're both at the hospital at the same time, and they have these ideas that when we get together here in the future, when we get out of the hospital, we're going to help each other's careers. So Myron finishes his degree at Western Reserve, graduates in uh, 1943. Merle must have had second <coughs> thoughts because here we have him as being a streetcar operator here in Cleveland. So again, may never have gone into the legal field, but streetcar operations in the 40s and 50s, Cleveland was moving away from this. You'll remember that they sold their streetcars here to the city of Toronto. So what ends up happening is Merle goes to law school and Rosie becomes the breadwinner of the family and here's her working at the Lamb's Restaurant on Cedar Avenue. Merle graduates from Western Reserve in 1947. This is a picture of uh, Merle with his best friend from law school, Elmer Selman, who ended up becoming a, a professor at the University of Akron. So initially, what Merle does is Merle begins working with Myron Hoff. A couple of months he works with him, and then he ends up getting a job with Cy Minor. When we talk about legends here of attorneys here in the Cleveland area, Cy Minor. First name that probably comes into, into mind. Now I'm sorry about this being a poor quality <coughs> photograph, but here's Merle with Cy Minor, and then Garrett Morgan, son of the uh, inventor. So Cy uh, Minor was the first African-American prosecuting attorney in Cuyahoga County. There's a ton of stories about Cy. Uh, one of the stories that the Stoke brothers would tell of when he gave his closing arguments, he'd have two packed suitcases, 
And he would tell the jury, he goes, if you let this person free, I've packed my bags and I'm leaving. I'm going on the next train and I'm leaving town. Now, I don't know if Judge Sheehan would allow that argument here today, but it was quite successful uh, in, the 19, uh, in the 1940s. And that's who Merle learned from. And isn't this a wonderful profession that we're all in? It's how we learn from others here. We heard from Jim here about how he learned. He saw how Merle tried cases. We've all watched and look how, looked how you know, Jim tries cases, and we learned from that. It's a really amazing, amazing profession. Now, let's talk about Foster. Let's talk about Merle's brother. He goes into the military, serves his country in World War II, and he sees it's segregated. Segregated. So he comes back to the United States. He's concerned about racism in the United States and also labor uh, relations. He tries to bring Paul Robeson into town here. And Paul, what he had done here is Paul was a famous athlete, all-American, singer, film star. He goes and he meets with uh, Harry Truman in 1947 and says, are we going to integrate the armed forces? Truman says no, says it's not politically expedient. Well, Robeson didn't appreciate that and actually got kicked, the reports already got kicked out of the White House. Kicked out. So Foster tries to get Paul to come to Cleveland. He did come to visit. Foster is also trying to unionize various factories in Cleveland. The judge, the federal judge at the time, James Connell, doesn't allow him to picket these, these various factories. So they decide, OK, we'll picket the judge's house. Again, I don't know how Judge Sheehan would deal with this. Foster is sentenced to 10 days in jail and fined 500 bucks. Merle's taking perhaps a different approach here. We talked about that divide between the McCurdy family and the Foster family, how best from which to help our race to succeed here. And you see Foster took maybe a, perhaps a little bit more militant view. But here's Merle in 1952 who accepts a position with the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor, Frank Culleton. Uh, he leaves Cy Miner's office, and Cy has to hire both Carl and Louis Stokes to fill up the, the workload here. Again, how it is we're all connected. What do you think the prosecutor's office looked like in 1952? Okay, here we go. 19 lawyers, okay, 19 lawyers. So here you have Frank Culleton here on the right front. You have Tom Perino here, who ends up being the chief prosecutor in the Sam Shepard case. And uh, where's Merle? Oh, yeah, okay, way, way back in the back here, okay? I've loved the discussions that we've had with Judge Sheehan's, uh, you know, there's this history group that meets when it can on Friday afternoons, and we've discussed whether or not the Cleveland legal market, was it segregated? Was it, was it not? Um, you know, arguments for and against that, but Merle, was described as being one of, you know, along with Tom Perino, the two best prosecutors in the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office at that time. Generally speaking, Merle would handle the prosecutions of African American defendants. Tom would handle more prominent uh, cases or cases involving uh, uh, white, uh, white defendants. Uh, here's Merle meeting with uh, Dorothy uh, Kilgallen here. She was a reporter during the Sam tri uh, Shepard trial. Uh, she would later report that the judge on that case said that um, Sam Shepard was guilty as hell, okay? And F. Lee Bailey used that as a basis from which to seek a, a new trial for uh, Sam Shepard. Just as what Jim Willis said, Merle, smooth as silk. That's why I was smooth as silk in the uh, courtroom. So this is a picture in the mid-50s from the plain dealer, and, and that's what uh, you know, everyone has said. And he had the same dramatics as Cy Minor, and on the defense side, they'd have him with his fingers tapping you know, along here, and then he'd point to the prosecutor's office, and, well, why can't they be fair? So this, this um, work that's done, I think, from Jim, and with Cy and with Merle here about bringing some theatrics here into the courtroom. That's quite successful. 
So it turns uh, 1960. Cleveland is at the head of its time here. Uh, before we're giving uh, free attorneys to persons charged with criminal cases here. Uh, we have a situation here where Cleveland creates our public defender's office, and here Merle is the public defender, and who does he hire? His golfing buddy here, Jerry Gold here, who's behind him. Uh, and they would play on a regular basis at the Highland uh, Golf Course, and we've already heard just two brilliant litigators. No question here uh, about that. So the question here is, is have we turned a corner here? Do we have more in the way of acceptance? And during the 1960 presidential campaign, John F. Kennedy gives a speech saying it's about time that we appoint African Americans to federal positions, federal judgeships, U.S. attorneys, other positions here within our federal government. And, spoiler alert, Kennedy wins, okay? And uh, he will get an appointment. Appointment. He will be anointed, I guess, here, okay? But do we still have a segregated society? Now, I'm gonna have Amy take these two here about Idlewild, Michigan. Sure, yeah. So, Idlewild, Michigan, Western Michigan, a resort town that was popular 50s, 60s, at one time they said that over, what, July 4th, 1959, they had over 25,000 people just visiting on that day. So picture that, imagine that. Um, it was, at the time, why Western Michigan? What was the big deal? In Western Michigan, before civil rights, this was the very, one of the very few places where, peop where black people could per acquire property. And so it became an extremely popular resort town. This is the club El Morocco that featured um, such musical acts as Count Basie, Louis Armstrong, Aretha Franklin, the Four Tops. There's multiple books, legends. It's there's you visited. There's we've seen many photos. Um, resort. Um, this was a beach resort that was uh, built in the 1920s. Um, was the popular go-to place. It was torn down in the 1950s, but a lot of the photos that you see um, about Idlewild will showcase this particular location. So, Merle gets the appointment as a U.S. Attorney in 1961, so here's a, a canned photograph of uh, Merle opening up the letter. You know, surprise, he's been appointed by President Kennedy as U.S. Attorney. And he takes the oath of office from Judge James Connell, who 12 years earlier was the same judge who put Foster in jail for 10 days. <laughs> so we have this swearing in ceremony here. You have Judge Perry B. Jackson. No, that's Judge White. Oh, is this White. Judge White? My fault? Okay. Judge White. My bad, my bad. So uh, here we have a picture here with that. Uh, here we have also, we have some persons from DC that have uh, come out here too. Uh, to the swearing in. So we have on the left, we have Andrew uh, Hatcher, who was the deputy uh, press secretary. And then you had Dr. Robert Weaver, who was the administrator of housing and home finance. Senator, or excuse me, President Kennedy attempted to make him the first African American to hold a cabinet position of the housing and urban development, but the Southern senators denied that. He ended up not becoming a member of HUD until uh, 1966 during the Johnson administration. But again, just this <coughs> issue here or the situation here where Kennedy is actually putting uh, African Americans into high positions within our federal government. So here we have another picture here of some of the dignitaries here in the room. But here is Merle next to an unnamed teacher here from Conneaut, Ohio. So by November of 61, Merle is rounding out his, uh, his team of, uh, of attorneys. You may remember this person right here, right? Bert, Judge Burt Griffin. Burt Griffin had uh, worked here for the Eisenhower administration, was a holdover here at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Merle didn't forget his roots. Charlie Diamond is from Ashtabula County, and uh, Bernie uh, Stoplinski. His family actually owned a store that would supply the ore boats with goods during the 40s and 50s. So some Ashtabula County roots here as well as local roots here in Cuyahoga County who you certainly would be familiar with. 
Here's uh, Merle with RFK. And we get to June of uh, 1962, and we talk about political hit jobs that are done. There's a meeting that occurs of the House Un-American Activities that talks about commies here from Cleveland. A woman takes the stand and is naming names, naming all these persons from Cleveland that are commies, and then it says, oh, what about Foster McCurdy, uh, the U.S. Attorney's uh, brother? And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 uh, Foster McCurdy, he's also a commie as well. This caused embarrassment, caused embarrassment here, and I, I when you look at the testimony of what occurred, it didn't look like it was a political hit job here from which to try um, to damage Merle's, uh, Merle's reputation. And it didn't help that Foster, Merle had helped his brother get a job at the clerk's office here in the county. And you can see what uh, Merle responded here. It's like, look, I don't know what it is my brother did 12, 14 years ago, but we've had you know, a falling out that has occurred. Kind of sad, you know, kind of sad about how politics would cause that to happen. Next month, though, uh, Merle gives a speech here at the uh, NAACP convention in Atlanta, uh, gets to you know, meet uh, with Dr. Martin Luther King as well as Reverend Ralph uh, Abernathy. It's interesting, the speech, when you read it, because he talks about the prominence here of the number of African Americans that are becoming uh, judges. So Thurgood Marshall, general counsel for the NAACP, ends up getting a federal judgeship. Uh, he talks about himself and C uh, Cecil Poole as U.S. attorneys in addition to uh, the other uh, individuals that I have, I have uh, mentioned here. And he said, how did we get there? It wasn't by accident. It was based on the power of the ballot. And he says that we have a duty here from which to preserve our rights through vigilance and fortitude. One of Merle's legacies, and this was previously mentioned uh, about, and this that was Nathaniel Jones. So in, uh, in the fall of uh, 62, he has an opening in the U.S. Attorneys. He actually hires Nate Jones as the first African-American assistant U.S. Attorney. He was initially didn't want to make that appointment because he thought he would be accused of favoritism towards hiring persons of his own race. And um, Robert Kennedy said, that's, that's why we put you in the position. That's what we want you to do. And uh, what happens with Nate Jones, uh, you know, general counsel for the NAACP, Sixth Circuit, you know, Court of Appeals judge. Uh, personal interests, he loved golf. I think I mentioned previously, uh, you know, he played over at Highland. You see all of his golf trophies in the back. I think he shared that with uh, Judge Sheehan. I noticed a few golf trophies in the back here of your office all as well. Place. <laughs> These are all first place. He was in a couples league here with Rosie, and truth be told, Rosie was the better golfer. So their 27th wedding anniversary, they're tearing down the Holiday Hotel. Merle saves that little lever from the elevator, and he goes, Dear Rosie, this is a little campy. Dear Rosie, since I met you operating this control 27 years ago, your love has elevated me up and you have never let me down. I will always love you, Merle. A collective <laughs> He adored his uh, grandchildren, but never forgot about his roots. So here he is, uh, touring with his grandchildren, a tugboat. But does Merle still remain on the outside looking in? And um, he ended up getting an appointment from LBJ to the Kerner Commission that we'll talk about here shortly. But Amy and I scoured through photographs here from the LBJ collection, also uh, the John F. Kennedy collection, because you have photographers that follow the president around, and anyone you meet, we get pictures of that. So we're hoping we're going to find a picture of Merle with the president, and uh, this is the best we could do. <laughs> this is the best that we could do. And so here you get the idea, here's Merle and Rosie, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's Gregory Peck. Which, you know, here we as attorneys, what's, what's our favorite movie and favorite book of all time? To Kill a Mockingbird. To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Fitch. And so here, you know, wow, we have that sort of idea of what social justice means and what it should be all about. So he's invited to the ball, but is he really a part of it? 
So there's a new chapter in Merle's life. Um, we have racial violence that's occurring throughout the 1960s. LBJ sets up a commission, the Kerner Commission here, from which to look at what is the reason for that uh, violence. Merle is set up as the counsel for that. Nate Jones is an assistant. I love this photograph. Love this photograph because in Hoover's mind, the purpose or the reason that we had all this racial violence was because it was communist activity. It was commies that were causing this. And Merle played a very instrumental role, role in cross-examining Hoover's witnesses to say that this was a bunch of communist subversives, and he destroyed them on cross-examination. So the end result of the report here is they're like, nah, it's not commies, it is poverty in our inner cities. That's what was causing the unrest. And so what are we going to do about that? And you get that from Merle's expression on his face. It's kind of like, you son of a gun. Because was this the guy who was responsible for Foster <laughs> having to go through with that hearing that he was a communist? So here you have the Kerner Commission report issued in February of 1968. The final conclusion of this here is our nation is moving towards two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal. Think about this with respect to the McCurdy family, the success that they had on the ore boats, the success that Merle had, but yet still not quite there. So uh, by March of 1968, he's appointed by President uh, Johnson to be our nation's first consumer council. He was looking forward to this because he was going to deal with price fixing and those frauds that occur on our most, um, our populations that are most vulnerable. But uh, it wasn't meant to be. He passes away. Circumstances of it, uh, he and his good friend, uh, uh, Myron Hoff, they would go in periodically to get vitamin B12 shots. They go in together from which to see their regular doctor. The regular doctor isn't there, it's someone else. It's someone else. Myron's like, no thanks, I'm not gonna get the shot. Merle's like, hey, it's okay, let's get our usual shot. He does, and he ends up uh, dying over at Cleveland Hopkins International uh, Airport on his way to fly over to Washington, uh, D.C. He dies in between Martin Luther King and uh, Robert F. Kennedy. Same time frame there, within a, you know, a few months here in 1968. So this is kind of a buzzkill, isn't it? You know, because we wonder what would have happened here if Merle had, uh, had lived. One of Merle's friends was George Steinbrenner. Yes, that George Steinbrenner. George Steinbrenner owned uh, the American Shipbuilding Company. What he does is he buys one of those Morgan-class ore boats, those 600-foot ore boats, that originally started as the Dickinson and renames it the Merle McCurdy. So we've gone full circle here. A family that got their start here on the ore boats, and now we have an ore boat named after Merle. And Steinbrenner indicates why that's the case here and about its, you know, Merle exemplified here about what we should do about making opportunities available to all, regardless of gender or race. So here's the family that's going out for the christening of the ship. You see Bernie over here, Brenda and her husband Ted and the grandchildren here, and Rosie here, Municipal Stadium here in the background. And here's the ore boat here, uh, the Merle McCurdy next to the Henry Steinbrenner here. So uh, this boat has another life here for a number of, of, uh, of years here. Um, go back. It uh, continues in service until 1985. Uh, it's then brought to Ashtabula to be dismantled. As they're dismantling it, there's concerns that they're not dealing with the asbestos. So the U.S. attorney from the Northern District of Ohio has to get involved to stop the EPA violations. And then the boat is sent across over it into Western Ontario from which to be dismantled. Brothers reunited. Uh, Foster dies. Um, in, in 1978, he's buried with military honors. 
uh, at the same Highland uh, Cemetery, uh, same Highland Cemetery. And here's the return of the Merle McCurdy to Asheville County from which to be dismantled before uh, the EPA violations. Now, I have to mention one other person here as we're talking about the McCurdy uh, legacy here, and that's <coughs> Dr. Howard Douglas McCurdy, who would be Merle's cousin. They shared the same grandfather, George Douglas McCurdy, who served on the ore boats. Um, Great man. First African Canadian here from which to earn tenure from a university in, in Canada. One of the first members of parliament in Canada. <coughs> Same family. Same family. And here you see Howard in this picture. He's won the Order of Ontario. He would also win the Order of Canada <coughs> here, equivalent to our Medal of Freedom. I had the distinct honor from which to meet Dr. McCurdy uh, in Amherstburg, and this pulpit was carved by their mutual relative, Nasa McCurdy, son of a former slave. And we are blessed here to have Dr. McCurdy's widow here. We lost Howard uh, in February, February 20th here earlier this year, and I'd like to have Brenda McCurdy stand here because this presentation is really an honor here to have. So, you know, I had that, that picture here of Merle's gravestone of how he dies in 1968, but here Howard is one who's continuing on with the family's work for another uh, 50, 50 years. And I want you to have hope for the future because here's a family reunion that we had a number of years ago here with other members of the McCurdy family. So that legacy will continue uh, to grow. And you see our old friend here, Judge Lambros, here in the front of this picture. 